couldn't find Nicole anywhere. I saw Sharif across the way. He's standing, his arm is bloody. He's got his arms behind his back, clearly handcuffed. And he's got those credentials around his neck. Finally, I'm brought to him. We're standing there saying, we are journalists. You must release us. Um, they charge me with misdemeanor, something like uh, interfering with a peace officer, if only there was a peace officer there. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I said, you've got to loosen these handcuffs so they tighten them. But as we're saying, you can see our credentials. Uh, the Secret Service came and ripped them from around our neck, and then I'm brought to the um, police wagon. There was Nicole inside. Her face was bloody. She described quickly what happened. She had the credentials around her neck. She was handcuffed. She said that they had come out from St. Paul. Uh, neighborhood network, the public access station, because they heard a commotion. There were police there, there were riot police, and there were protesters. She was filming. They came at her very, very quickly. They're shouting, um, on your face, on your face. And she's shouting back, press, press. She's showing her press pass, and she's filming. She didn't plan to film her own violent arrest, and they took her down. You hear her screaming as she goes down on her um, face. Uh, they've got a knee or boot in her back, and inexplicably they're dragging on her leg. They're pulling on her leg, so they're dragging her face on the ground, which is what bloody and the first thing they do is they pull the battery out of her camera if you have any question about what it was that they wanted to accomplish. Um, we were, I was put in the police garage where the protest cages were erected. You know, hundreds of peaceful protesters were arrested that week. Um, and Sharif and Nicole were taken to jail. They faced PC felony riot charges, probable cause felony riot. The video of our arrest went viral. Uh, most watch YouTube video for the first two days of the convention. The response was tremendous. I guess hundreds, thousands of people did everything, calling, tweeting, uh, faxing, uh, emailing. And so we got out hours later. A show the grassroots outcry, the effect of it, uh, Sharif was in the cell with the AP photographer. He wasn't released when Sharif was. So then later that night I go to the convention and networks want to talk to me about what happened. I describe what happened in the NBC skybox and when they turn off the camera, the NBC reporter next to me doing a stand-up says, I don't get it, why wasn't I arrested? I said, oh, were you covering the protest? And he said, no. So I said, well, I'm not being arrested in the skybox either. 90% uh, of life is just showing up, that's what Ray Allen said. Um, and it's very serious. The next morning, we went. Uh, there was a police conference. The new, the St. Paul police chief uh, held a news conference. John Harrington. So I went to cover it. The police officer opening the door for the press conference happened to be my processing officer. And so you not only have to let me in, you have to let me out. At the end of this news conference, um, I went in. Uh, you know, the police chief is there. I describe what happened in the news conference to the three of us, and I asked him, "What? How do you expect us to operate, journalists, to operate in this atmosphere? And what have you instructed your police to do?" He said, "You can embed with the mobile field force. Embed, embed with the mobile field force. You know what he's talking about." embedding in the front lines of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. That becomes the model for how we cover American politics in American cities. I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. What do you get when you're embedded in the front lines of troops in Iraq, when you're sleeping with them, eating with them, when your life is in their hands? When you're looking at the conflict through the crosshairs, through the trigger end of the gun? What about being embedded in Iraqi hospitals, Afghan communities, the peace movement around the world to get the full effects of war? As we write in our second book, Static, the reason we call it that is because in this high-tech digital age with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we ever get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality. Well, what we need is the dictionary definition of static. Criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. These are the movements that will save us and have made this country great. That's what we need to hear and watch in the media that is using not private property, remember, even though they are corporations that run the corporate media, they are leasing our airwaves, a national treasure. You know, it is no joke when they arrest journalists, not to mention any wrongful arrest. But we should not have to get a record to put things on the record. There's a reason why our Constitution has explicitly protected only journalists. Uh, because journalism is a, 
check and balance on power. You know, Thomas Jefferson said if he had a choice of a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, he would choose the latter. Mm -hmm. It's that important, and it's that important right now. We are dealing with global crises, global war and global warming, the global economic meltdown, the lack of health care in this country, the crisis of immigration and how people who come to this country, like so many for centuries, but now are being vilified and criminalized. And that's why we need an open media where you can hear everyone's voices, where we can really argue about, hash out these critical issues. And when you just have these eight or nine second sound bites, what do you get in that? Just a reinforcement of the status quo, but the status quo has gotten us into this situation to begin with. Um, we talk about so many remarkable people uh, in this uh, book, Standing Up to the Madness, that we've met on previous tours that we go out to cover because they're just so inspiring. Every stop we make, we meet more people, so it's hard to limit the book, but it is so inspiring from the young to the old. Um, one of the stories we tell is about a group of kids in Wilton, Connecticut, um, who try to do a play about the war based on statements that soldiers have made or letters they've written home. It's their annual play, they get to choose one every year, and they wrote it with their teacher, Bonnie Dickinson. And um, they write the play, they're making the costumes, they're learning the scripts, and the principal walks in and he says, no, you won't be performing this play on the Wilton High stage. And they said, why? And he said, because it's too controversial, it's about war. And they begged, they pleaded, but he said, that ship has sailed, and it sailed them right onto the New York stage. That's right, New York theaters heard about the censorship, and they invited the kids to do what actors dream of all their lives, and that is to be, uh, oh, these are the mailing lists, sign up, get our daily digest, get our headlines, get our media alerts, and that's Dennis Moynihan, who's responsible for this crazy <laughs> So, um, the Wilton High stage uh, that they didn't get to perform on, but they perform in New York before the New York Culture Project and the public theater, and packed with hundreds of theater goers. But what was most poignant were the soldiers in the audience. The soldiers because, well, they were there to see their own words dramatized. So when this story got big and it got into the New York Times, um, the, a guy named Ira Levin, who is a playwright, he just recently died, wrote a letter, and he congratulated the kids. He, um, he said he, well, he, he wrote The Stepford Wives, and he said he actually grew up in Wilton, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said The Stepford Wives were based on Wilton, Connecticut. <laughs> so he congratulated the kids for not being Stepfordized. <laughs> One of the stories. Uh, David might talk about another story in Connecticut, but um, I will end with November 4th, 2008, this remarkable moment. Um, the day the world heaved a sigh of relief. Uh, it wasn't just a local election, a national election. Uh, it was a global event. Barack Obama was a global figure, right? His father is a black man from Kenya, his mother a white woman from Kansas. He's born in Hawaii, grown up partly in Indonesia, then sent back to be raised by his mom's, grand his mom's parents in uh, Hawaii goes to Occidental College and then graduates from Columbia, becomes an organizer on the south side of Chicago, then becomes the first black president of the Harvard Law Review, then goes back to community organizing on the south side of Chicago, and then, well, you know the rest, he ends up the first African-American president of this country. Imagine parents all over this country are saying to their kids, maybe you could be a community organizer too. <laughs> <laughs> and how did he win? Well, uh, I mean, he mobilized millions of people, young people. 67% uh, of Latinos voted for Barack Obama, 95% of African Americans, 70% of single women seem to be identified as a new voting bloc, voted for Barack Obama. And he opted out of the public financing of campaigns, big problem, the issue of how politics just yeah. marinates and money is swamped by it, is determined by it, is corrupted by it. And he got it from sort of two different sources. Millions of people giving little amounts of money, maybe not giving money at all, just putting in their energy, but then also the small circle of people who gave millions of dollars, or corporations that gave millions of dollars. Who's going to win out? 
right? The millions who gave little 